The Secrets of Middle-Earth is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Middle-Earth, where we discuss the hidden themes and deeper layers found in the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, whether in his writings or in any of the media derived from them. I'm Jeff Hecker, and joining me today are Thomas Salerno. Hi, Thomas. Hey there, Jeff. And Patrick Mason. Hi, Pat. Howdy, Jeff. And be sure to follow The Secrets of the Middle Earth in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, which had to update our, our form here. It's actually being discontinued and transferred to YouTube Music in April, so Boo. maybe maybe <laughs> subscribe on both or multiple platforms so you don't miss an episode, uh, Spotify, or any other podcast directory or app. And find us on social media at facebook.com slash darkwestmedia or on Twitter where we are at SQPN or on Instagram where we are at Starquest Network. And don't forget that you can get your own official Secrets of Middle Earth merch, including our awesome t-shirt at sqpn.com slash merch. And it's a great way for you to support the show and show your love for Tolkien and his wonderful world of Middle Earth. And before we get into tonight's topic, um... As far as news goes, we still don't have a trailer for Rings of Power. <laughs> so not uh, as, as of recording. No. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't really see any other major news items. I think the last kind of the big speculation um stuff about that we talked about last time probably is the has been the biggest news. I, I don't know if either of you have any any news items you saw that you wanted to bring up. No, nothing I've seen. Mm-mm. No. All right. Well, um, in that case, we'll move right along. And today we are celebrating Tolkien Reading Day. And this is our second annual Tolkien Reading Day. And just as a reminder, this is the from the Tolkien Society website. It is held on the 25th of March each year. The date of the 25th of March was chosen as the date on which the ring was destroyed, completing Frodo's quest and vanquishing Sauron. And it's been organized by the Tolkien Society since 2003 to encourage fans to celebrate and promote the life and works of J.R.R. Tolkien by reading favorite passages. And um, in our faith as Catholics, it is all the Annunciation, which was well planned out by Tolkien. And then Dom also pointed out that this year it is actually the beginning of Holy Week. So the topic of this year is pretty appropriate for that time, which is sacrifice and service. And it's so prevalent in Tolkien's works. I mean, just like looking through quotes and thinking about the stories and where these quotes take place. It's like, I mean, that's pretty much the whole stories are our sacrifice and service. And I mean, there's some, you know, fun along the way. And I think in last year it was travel and adventure, but um, I don't know, just if, if you had either of you had any general thoughts on, on this before we kind of jump into some of our favorite quotes that we picked to discuss, but Thomas, did you have any want to say anything just generally on on this topic for Tolkien? Well, yeah, just that, like, as you say, Jeff, it's so prevalent in the works that I knew which quotes I wanted to use, like pretty much immediately. I didn't have to think about it. Like I could already tell which one stood out to me as, you know, good service and sacrifice quotes. It's just like it permeates the whole legendarium. And I don't think that that should be too surprising, given that. Tolkien himself served as a soldier in World War I and sacrificed a whole lot and saw, you know, uh, a lot of awful things during combat. And so it's not surprising that like a lot of writers in his generation, that kind of came out in uh, in the fiction he wrote. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, just like reading. Yeah. Like I said, just I didn't have the top the, the quotes that I wanted kind of memorized already, but I was kind of looking up just kind of some things and the ones I found that I kind of landed on for mine are all like in some of my favorite parts in the, in the books. Um, anyway, so, which is, I mean, like I said, just pretty appropriate that it's, you know, it's, it's all kind of coming together with the topic, the time of the year, uh, being Holy week for this year. Um, but Patrick, any, uh, any general thoughts before we get into kind of our, our quotes that we've chosen? I mean, that my first general thought is you guys like totally stole all the good quotes. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. I did um, offer to, to let y'all have any if y'all wanted them. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's so very prevalent in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and it's slightly less prevalent in The Hobbit. Um, mm. it, it's definitely there. I mean, 
Bilbo sort of like realizes what he signed up for eventually. And there is a lot of sacrifice. I mean, I love the, you know, my birthday celebration was a stolen loaf of bread sitting on the side of a bank of <laughs> watching yeah, my friends one. come in barrels um, kind of a deal. So, you know, you get there, but I really, I kind of wanted to delve into the Silmarillion material and, and especially the, the Leia Balerion, because those Ooh. are, those are very sorrowful stories, but I wanted to see like how, how you could tease out the ser- the service and the sacrifice from them. And they're in there. Um, but it's not in the it's not in the same manner as the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I saw the ones you picked. I was like, oh man, he went for he went all into the history of Middle Earth and the and Silmarillion and the expanded stuff. So nice. Um, well, with that being said, I guess we can go ahead and um, I'll start with you, Thomas. If you want to go ahead and just read out your first quote, and you know, we'll go from there. Sure. So yeah, well, I I kind of picked. Um... For, for my three main ones, I picked one from each of the trilogy of The Lord of the Rings. So my first one is from The Fellowship of the Ring. It's uh, to set the scene here. Um, Frodo, Sam, and Pippin have just met. Uh, they're still in the Shire. They've just met uh, Gildor and some of the other elves uh, of Lindon who, are, who wander about in the Shire during autumn. And, uh, you know, they they rescued the hobbits from the black riders they have a feast and then it's morning now the elves are gone and the hobbits are talking amongst each other and frodo asks sam if he wants to continue the quest even though his kind of life's ambition to see elves has already come to pass and they've barely started the journey (laughs) day two so So in answer to that um, sam says to frodo It isn't to see elves now, nor dragons, nor mountains that I want. I don't rightly know what I want, but I have something to do before the end, and it lies ahead, not in the Shire. I must see it through, sir, if you understand me. And I thought that was appropriate because, you know, it... First of all, if you're going to talk about service and sacrifice, you have to talk about Sam. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he ha- <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he has that that sort of ingrain. It's, it's like in his bones that like he he can he can see that that he, he has to do something. He's not quite sure what it is, but he has this feeling in his gut that he has to see through this quest wherever it leads him to. And, you know, I, I think that that's, you know, he's such a service motivated character. Like not only does, you know, he you know, he's essentially Frodo's like, you know, he's Frodo's gardener, he's Frodo's servant, and he, but he, he serves out of, out of love for, and not just because he works for Frodo, but because he genuinely loves him as a friend. And that service to a friend to the bitter end is probably the most, like, it, you, if, if you know what happens on the slopes of Mount Doom and you go back and read that quote, you're just like, wow. You know? <laughs> Yeah, like it's it sets the stage for like sort of the building. Oh, this is what I'm going to have to do to mm-hmm. to fulfill my service to Mister Frodo for this promise I made to Gandalf. You know, a million miles away. <laughs> yeah, you know, under a nice sun and a nice day. And I was just, I, I wish I could could reference this like specifically. I don't have the text in front of me, but I was just rereading. Uh, this morning, the the Waldman letter as part of the new edition of the the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, where he's writing to a prospective publisher and somewhere in, in there, he admits Sam is the hero of the story of mm. the Lord of the Rings. He says the hero is Sam. And I, I had no clue. Like, I know I knew a lot of fans said that, but I never knew that that was Tolkien's thought as well. Yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah, I mean, I I remember when I was first reading this and reading and watching the movies, like, I mean, I was all into the big battles and the, the you know, stuff Aragorn was doing and becoming king. But yeah, the more, and, and I mean, that's definitely important, but yeah, I mean, ultimately it's like everything they do in the, in the books is to basically give Frodo, a sh- give Frodo and Sam a chance. Um, mm-hmm. And, 
you know, even in which, well, I, one of my quotes talks about this later says when we get there, but yeah, it's like everything that they do is in support of, you know, they're all in support of the quest and which is, you know, at that point left to two, you know, the two most unlikely people of Sam and Frodo to, to get the ring the rest of the way. And they're like, we don't know, you know, at, at that point in return of the King, they don't know. They're like, we don't even know if they're alive. They can't, they have no idea. And they could be marching to their death and, and when they're March on Mordor, but they're doing it because they like, it's all they, it's they're trusting and they're have, they have hope and um, there. So, well, very cool. Well, Pat, if you want to go ahead and get your first quote and go from talk about it. Okay. Uh, all right, so this is from The Fall of Gondolin. I'll try and do my best Olmo voice. <laughs> nice. If I choose to send thee to our son of war, then believe not that thy own sword is not worth the sending. For the valor of the Adain, the elves shall ever remember as the ages lengthen, marveling that they gave life so freely, of which on earth they had so little. But it is not for thy valor, only that I send thee, but to bring into the world a hope beyond thy sight, and a light that shall pierce the darkness. So to give people a, a little background on that, that's Olmo, the Valar, talking to Tour, uh, right before he's going to send him on a quest to go to the city of Gondolin. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, this is pretty dark days in the first stage. We're coming to the close of the first stage. Morgoth is more or less taking control of the entirety of Middle Earth besides the three hidden kingdoms. Uh, and Tour is being sent to one of the hidden kingdoms, Gondolin. And what I like about that quote is it 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 wraps up both Tour's coming service to, you know, the Valar and to Eru by extension, but also the men's the sacrifice of the men. Because, you know, he's right. Like unlike the elves who, you know, most of the Noldor who fought against Morgoth had lived hundreds couple thousand years <laughs> like they had, had long lives for the most part you know most of the men that came over the mountains and and kind of saddled up with the elves they're still men i mean they're living long lives but they're still men um and i like that it talks about the sacrifice that the men make in their aid of the elves yeah i think it says somewhere that the elves marveled at the fact that the men were willing to sacrifice their very short lives for for essentially a, the, the elves battle yeah because they, their their battle with morgoth is much more personal and that yeah the fact that 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 the men are willing to serve and and die in this conflict is like they're like and and you guys barely you're you know you're here and then you're gone in terms of lifespan you know to them that's like it's it's almost incredible yeah i mean that's gonna be fun but also sad when we get there in our in our film Silmarillion recap <laughs> coverage but um but yeah just such a cool I, I really like that as well um because yeah I mean he's he's a human being sent to one of the hidden cities of the elves like I think is he the first human to go there uh or or one of he's one of the only if he's not the first I think uh, he is yeah wait I thought I thought Huor and Hurin went there first the 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 two men from the previous generation yeah you know i think right? you're right i think okay. they had yeah. been there um because he, for for that battle that last battle the forces of gondola do issue forth right um, yeah and then they do retreat and but who are makes the stand right that allows them mm -hmm. to retreat he's one of the the last on the hill right okay yeah so yeah it's like 40 trolls or balrogs or something he, he's yeah and, and when hurin gets taken for his trouble mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> it's more goth <laughs> well i i actually really like tour tour is is probably one of my favorite human characters in the silmarillion there's just something about his um you know and the fact that he kind of integrates into gondolin and is willing you know he and and serves the king loyally, you know, and becomes like a loyal subject and, and defends his city and his newfound people to like, you know, the again, to like the bitter end against the siege, you know, 
it's it's really too bad we didn't get a full length treatment of that from Tolkien. I know. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, and then I mean, it's almost like there's that you know there's that noble there's that you know Meyer blood trickling down the line to these people, and because mm-hmm. um, because eventually we'll find out that you know Aragorn is uh, descended from him from Tor because I, right. I believe he's. Um, Elros's uh Tor is Elros's uh grandfather. So yes. yeah. I mean, yes. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. So I mean you could all yeah, jokingly I'll say you could look at it as Tor just wanted, you know, an end with the elves and to, you know, get get to be in that, you know, part of that bloodline or whatever. But right. um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, very cool. Yeah, that'll be fun when we get there. And from what I what I remember, the 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 history of Middle Earth is actually like a it goes into a lot more detail on his coming into Gondolin and uh, which mm-hmm. is cool. So, but yeah, that's a story for another time. So, um, but I guess it's my turn for a quote. So for my first one, I went back to the fellowship and this is even earlier in, um, in the book than Thomas's quote. I believe this is chapter two when Gandalf is first telling Frodo about the ring, but it's in, um, so if this sounds, from, you know, if you've seen the films more recently, you've read this may sound familiar coming from uh, Pippin, but it's actually a, a quote from Frodo and the, or, or for it's an exchange between Frodo and Gandalf, even it's pretty much word for word. But um, anyway, it's when Frodo's, you know, Gandalf's telling Frodo what he, what he pr- will need to do. And he's Frodo says, I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. And so do I, said Gandalf. And so do all to, who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. And I think that's just such a powerful quote. I mean, we're, I feel, you know, any time in history, there's always stuff going on, but there's, there's definitely a lot going on in our world today. Um, and just like, you know, it can be overwhelming at times to think of, think of what, what can you do, you know, in face of, of, the, of everything going on. And this kind of a thing reminds us, you know, there's, and I have my other quote toward the end is kind of similar to this, but it just reminds me to try to, you know, what can I do in this, in, in this time in my life? You know, I'm, I have to work, you know, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm working and raising my family and that doesn't leave too much time for other things. So it's like, how can I, what can I do to, you know, to further the cause as it were. And, you know, it's, it's that there's those, there's that old quote from, I can't remember who says it, but, or and it, it may just be kind of a popular saying, but it's like when there's times of a dragon's, um, you know, God brings dragon slayers or something. It's something along those lines. I, I, I should have, you know, gotten that quote, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's just something that speaks to me right now and trying to, you know, raise my kids in the faith and, um, you know, live my life, life in this world. That's, that's not very, it's pretty opposed to, to those, uh, you know, those of the faith. So, um, but yeah, I just think that that's cool that it, it kind of kicks off Frodo's, you know, and Gandalf is right there from the beginning. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I get it. It's it's going to be tough. <laughs> and um, he's even, I think, thinking at the time that, you know, Frodo won't actually have to go, or maybe he knows Frodo will have to go to Mordor. But, like, at that point, the quest is get the ring to, to Rivendell. Um, but it's kind of Gandalf urging and a Frodo accepting that, you know, this burden. And, um, yeah, in the film, it's even, you know, it's it, I believe it happens during the, the Siege of Gondor when Pippin and Gandalf are, you know, kind of huddling under a broken wall and about, you know, thinking they're about to die and Pippin. Oh, there's a that. similar exchange. Yeah. Then, it's not yeah. word for word, but yeah, it's something, it's, yeah. it's something similar. But. I think they do the exact like word for word one when they're in Moria, right? In fellowship. Okay, maybe that's what I'm thinking. I'm, yeah. Maybe that's what I'm, you know, I'm just thinking of, <laughs> of, uh, of that, but yeah. Um, anyway, they, yeah, that's my first one. So I guess we'll go ahead and go back to you, Thomas, if you're ready to go for your next one. Yeah, um, I would mention, though, that I used to keep that your quote, Jeff, tacked up on my bulletin board when I was younger (laughs) as like an inspirational saying from Gandalf. (laughs) I mean, it's a good one. Like it reminds me of like a there's a sister Lucia quote that's very, very much the same. People are asking her like about all these terrible prophecies and like, what do we do? What do we do? And she's like, just evangelize whoever is in front of you. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I can do that. (laughs) That I can do. I can't move a, you know, I can't move a mountain. 
Yeah, it's like Maybe live one, your life, put one yeah. foot in front of the other, you know? Do the, it, it's like what, uh, you know, Mother Teresa used to say too, like, because that people used to say to her, oh, there's, there's so many poor people in the, in the world who are like desperately poor. And she's like, yeah, help the poor people right in front of you in, in your neighborhood, in your home, you know, that's where you start, start there, you know? But yeah, uh, my next quote uh, is from the two towers and, um, is a quote from Faramir and it kind of represents um, kind of what I was talking a little bit about earlier, you know, uh, Tolkien's thoughts on war and peace, you know, given that, you know, he was a veteran of the first world war um, at this point, uh, Faramir, I believe he's already taken Frodo and Sam to the, the Rangers hideout in Ithilien or they're on their way there. And they're talking about, you know, the war against Sauron and the, the men under his control. And Faramir says to the hobbits, war must be while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I live, I love only that which they defend. And I thought that pretty much encapsulates J.R.R. Tolkien's own thoughts about this subject, you know, especially, you know, Again, re reading his letters recently during the Second World War, when some of his sons are deployed and he's saying to himself, you know, my, the, the cause I believe in is England. You know, it's not the war itself that I believe in, you know, or the whole world politics of like the allies and all the United Nations and all that stuff. He's like, no, it's just England, our home, you know that is worth fighting for and worth saving. Yeah. And even to go beyond that, I, Faramir is kind of, kind of Tolkien himself. Like he's kind of that, that warrior, that soldier who, who kind of hates that he has to be a warrior and a soldier. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's, that, that's a great one. Cause he's, you know, that's like him, him putting himself in the story. Yeah. To some extent. Yeah. I, and I really thought so. Cause like, yeah, he, he, he actually, I think he finished up his university career before being deployed in in combat in the First World War, which it turns out was actually kind of like, I wouldn't say risky, but it was it was difficult for him to do because apparently in, in England, and this was about, I think, 1915 or 16, if you were a young man and you weren't in uniform, you actually run the ran the risk of getting publicly shamed by people. So like, and there's there's evidence from his letters that like, I guess that that may have happened to him at one point. You know, even though he he was he was going to join the army as soon as he graduated, like it didn't matter. There was such like a war fever among people that like, if you were if you weren't in uniform, they just assumed you were a coward, and that really like. He he mentions in some of his letters how that just that that hurt, you know, being being considered. And he was a sensitive guy anyway, you know. Like you said, like he's like Faramir, he's literary, he likes lore, he likes music. He's only doing this because he has to, you know. And like how they 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 contrast in the book too, Faramir and Boromir, you know, Boromir. I wouldn't say he likes war for his own sake, but but. He definitely enjoys feats, feats of martial prowess or kind of for their own sake. Whereas Faramir's just like, nope, I just do this because it's part of the job. Yeah, the the real reason you go to war, right? Like, we're not going to war to fight. <laughs> we're, we're going to war for, you know, to defend something. Mm -hmm. And so that we don't have to fight longer <laughs> or later on, you know? Yeah. Very good. Well, Pat, you ready for your next one? I guess so, yes. <laughs> All right, so uh, my next one is from Baron and Luthien. <clears throat> um, and this isn't a quote. Uh, this is a quote from the book, not a quote spoken by one person uh, to another. Um, but I thought it spoke to that story. So, yet at the last, Baron was slain by the wolf that came from the gates of Angband, and he died in the arms of Tenuviel, 
but she chose mortality and to die from the world so that she might follow him. And it is sung that they met again beyond the sundering seas, and after a brief time walking alive once more in the green woods, together they passed, long ago, beyond the confines of this world. So it is that Luthien Tenuviel, alone of the elf kindred, has died indeed and left the world, and they have lost her whom they most love. So this this scene comes after Baron has taken the Silmaril from Baron and Luthien have taken the Silmaril and have fled Morgoth and they let loose the wolf of all wolves and uh, chases <clears throat> Baron down and basically bites his hand off <laughs> along with the, yeah. <laughs> and bites his hand off and the Silmaril causes him such pain that he goes into a death thrall and destroys like a whole forest <laughs> in this thrall. Uh, and Baron uh, dies from his wounds, effectively. And um, Luthien uh, Tenuvio basically sues, sues for his life for hers. She's going to give up her, her uh, immortality or her, you know, I've, I've heard it called grace sometimes, but I, I, I don't know if I like that. But <laughs> she's going to give up her, her immortality, her effectively being an elf for him and i i i don't know what's a better portrayal of sort of the sacrificial love of marriage um mm. in in this because that's effectively you know baron luthien this is how baron you know wins her hand right he gives the silmaril to thingle and that allows him to marry luthien and uh, Thingol's very mad about it, but he also has a Silmaril, and it brings him nothing but but sadness <laughs> and sorrow from that point on. <laughs> um, and so, be but, careful what you yeah. wish for, Thingol. Yeah, yeah. And it it the whole story speaks to the concept of service to one another, Luthien and Baron, um, who really only just want to be together. And have to, they both effectively sacrifice their lives for each other in different ways. Um, so that's that's why I picked that quote. Yeah, that's a great one. And yeah, especially because, I mean, Baron and Luthien is, I mean, that's Tolkien kind of putting himself and in, in Edith into the story mm -hmm. to some extent. And I mean, I think I've heard it said that <clears throat> Baron and Luthien, the, the, you know, the initial Baron and Luthien story is one of the oldest one of his earliest writings of middle earth because it was such a, you know, personal thing. Um, you know, I'd, I've never done the research to see, you know, and review drafts of, <laughs> of the writing at various stages, but, but yeah, that's a great one. And yeah, I mean, it'll be looking at these, you know, I, I didn't have the chance to like really delve into the, the Silmarillion quotes and stuff um, for this podcast, but that'll be fun when we get to those stories to discuss because because I mean, yeah, she's she's the the daughter of a Maiar. She's the daughter of we just recently talked about a uh, um, Melian Melian. and Thingol. She's she's the she's their daughter, and um, like she's like the most beautiful elf, like the most beautiful you know creature, I guess. Uh, and she gives a you know gives up her her immortality and that beauty for for Baron to save his life. Yeah, so it'll be fun when we get to their get to their story, but. All right. Well, I guess we'll go, go to my next one. And um, mine is, a, and it, this is kind of related because we're in the next month or two, we'll be discussing the film Return of the King, but um, which is, this quote is a, is a pretty different um, from that, what we see in the film, but it is from the chapter, the, the muster of Rohan in return, in return of the King. And this is just after um, a rider from Gondor has come with the red arrow. So in the, in the book, just to set the stage for those who may not remember the beacons that we see in the film were already lit and they were more of a warning system. They weren't a call for aid system. Um, so in the book, <clears throat> Denethor, who's a little bit less crazy in the, in the book than he is in the film <laughs> has, has, re <laughs> he's not, you know, holding out and saying, we can do this ourselves. We don't need Rohan. Um, but he sends the, he sends the red arrow, which was a symbol of friendship between Gondor and Rohan. And here's the quote uh, from Theoden. He says, "Dark tidings," said Theoden, "yet not all unguessed. But say to Denethor that even if Rohan itself felt no peril, still we would come to his aid. 
but we have suffered much loss in our battles with Saruman the traitor, and we must still think of our frontier to the north and east, as his own tidings make clear. So great a power as the Dark Lord seems now to wield might well contain us in battle before the city, and yet strike with great force across the river away beyond the Gate of Kings. But we will speak no longer counsels of prudence. We will come. And I think it's just such a great, and we've talked about how Thaden is in the book is pretty fairly different, at least in terms of his, his demeanor um, initially toward helping, you know, Gondor and others. But in the book, he's, you know, there's never a question that he's going to call, he's going to, um, he's going to go help Gondor. And I mean, in the film, it's a pretty dramatic and fun moment when the beacons are lit and, and rare one runs in saying the beacons are lit, but, um, but yeah, in, in the book, he's like, there's no doubt that he's going to come, that he's going to come for aid. And he knows he's probably bringing himself and a lot of his, a lot of his people to their death, but he knows, you know, if, if they don't give their all, then, you know, if they don't, if, if they don't send their aid, then Gondor will fall. And, the rest of the world will fall to Sauron most likely because there's just not any other, you know, there's, they're like the, they're the two big armies pretty much uh, of men that we know of. Um, but yeah, I just like that. I mean, Theoden's so cool in the books uh, I and mean, he's cool in the movies too, but in the books, he's just, he's such a good, such a cool King. Um, but. I think in, even in one of the appendices, it mentions that as a young man, uh, Theoden lived in Gondor for a while. Okay. So that he, he's actually, you know, it's not just that he's politically allied with this, with it, with this other country. He knows the land. He knows the people, you know, he's got a personal connection there too. Yeah. And it, cause it, cause in the, in the story, Gondor, it, Rohan was descended from some people who were given a piece of Gondor's territory and that, and that became mm-hmm. Rohan. So yeah, it's like they're not really, you know, that far removed. You know, maybe uh, several hundred or a thousand years or so, but they're still closely tied in terms of their, you know, they're they're kind of the big players in the human kingdoms um, of the West, I guess. Um, you know, there's obviously all the the Eastern kingdoms that we've we've hear a little bit out here and there, but um, yeah. yeah, I just like that. Um, and I know that Tolkien always used to say like. You know, because people would send him letters saying, oh, you know, your story is an allegory for World War Two. And he's like, you know, I started writing this like decades before <laughs> the Second World War. <laughs> but at the same time, like he, he says, like people see those kind of things in my book, because what I write is like applicable to kind of multiple points in history. But I, I almost like I can't help but see in the the really close alliance between Rohan and Gondor kind of, you know, like the, the quote unquote special relationship that was forged between the United States and the UK in the two world wars, you know, or especially in world war two and after, you know, and both of them, you know, were two of the founding members of NATO and stuff. And now there's just this expectation that, you know, if, if one country is in trouble, then the other will, will come to its aid, which is like, which is unthinkable to like previous generations of like our people, like going back to like, you know, the American revolution and all that. But like, uh, but yeah, I just can't help seeing, you know, like that, that in terms of the, these two countries that share this special relationship and this really close alliance, I, I just like that kind of friendship between peoples. It, it's a really cool idea and it's cool to see it both on screen and in the books. Yeah, and we'll, and yeah, I mean, Aragorn and Am or Am are kind of the they're kind of the next generation of you know of kings who mm. will kind of continue that friendship because I think in the appendices it kind of talks about how they they're you know they're like forever friends and they will yep. and they kind of go on missions to hunt down the rest of the orcs and <laughs> clear the land of of you know the evil, the remaining evil. Um, and I mean, uh, yeah, and between the friend, and it's kind of solidified in the marriage between Far- uh, Faramir and Eowyn, you know, because he's, Faramir's a, a noble and he's marrying, you know, someone of the royal line of Rohan. And so, it, yeah, kind of getting that, solidifying the friend, you know, the friendship there as well. So, but all right, well, 
Back to you. I guess it's back to you, Thomas, for your third quote here. So my third one is from Return of the King, and it, it's pretty much at the very, very end of the Return of the King. Um, Sam has just learned that Frodo it will no longer stay in Middle Earth, that he's going to go to the Grey Havens and take ship to the Undying Lands. And Sam expresses that he he thought Frodo was going to get to, to live peacefully in the Shire for years and years and that people would would, you know, would honor Frodo for all his achievements and stuff like that. But um, Frodo tells Sam, it must often be so, Sam, when things are in danger. Someone has to give them up, lose them, so that others may keep them. And I think that, to, to me, that was like, okay, that that's in one line distills this whole theme of like <laughs> sacrifice and service. You know, that it it's that sacrifice. It, it's sacrificing something that's going to be good for you so that other people can keep it. You know, I, I can't think of like of a better quote for this theme. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it makes me think of, of being a father myself and like the things we do to for our kids to, you know, to sacrifice for them. Um so that they can, you know, have a, have a better life or, you know, not in terms of, you know, economically or whatever that, that, that can be the case, but just wanting to, you know, especially as Christians trying to make sure they have, that you raise them in that, you know, so that they have a, they have a, you know, are, are raised in that, in the faith and can understand and grow in their own relationship. Um, so yeah, I mean, this, yeah, it just kind of sums up <laughs> their whole quest. So I, that's a really good one. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, that strikes me of like, that's just, I mean, that's kind of going off to war in general. Mm -hmm. Um, You see, nobody really seems to come back from it the same as they went off. And those are the people who come back, right? There are plenty of people who don't whenever the country goes to war. So I think that's, I mean, that's a great expression (laughs) for a really good summary of, of like, yeah, sometimes to keep the good thing good and available to other people, some people have to sacrifice it. I see. And I mean, he says in um, in uh, the foreword to The Lord of the Rings, he says that by 1918, all but one of my best friends were dead. So, like, you know, he can write this because he's lived it. He's, you know, he's seen it you know, one of the most ghastly, you know, conflicts in human history. And, oh, man, it's like... Just ridiculous attrition rates. Uh Uh-huh. And and a lot of people will say, you know, when the Americans came into the war, finally, it was different. And it's like, it really wasn't. Like, the Americans were suffering the same amount of... We just weren't in it for three years. For three years. (laughs) So, but, like, the, the number of men who didn't come back this scale was ridiculous i i remember there was a quote from one of the i think it was either it was one of the german officers towards the start of the war when they started using machine guns and he's like war is just stupid now like there's no (laughs) honor there's no like glorious fighting it's just this mass mess and it's just dumb. <laughs> and I feel like Tolkien kind of wanted to recapture that pre-mechanized war in the Lord of the Rings, which he does very effectively. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't help like when you read the Pelennor Fields or the the Hornburg, like if you're, you're you're like your spirit just like leaps somehow, and you're like the, at the sheer heroism of it. You know, where you know. And he and uh, and his another thing with with high attrition rates, you know, like the 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 fighter pilots in the the Second World War. Oh, and he yeah. was so worried because he one of his Christopher was in the RAF. And he's like, oh, my gosh. And he's like, he's he even talks about like the air, the, the, the war plane being like a literally diabolical invention. Like he hates it like. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. <laughs> Because he's like, he's like, you know, we've replaced horses with airplanes and, you know, it was a bad trade, you know, like. (laughs) 
he he says because he's like now he's like it's just machines fighting machines and you're just sitting in the airplane making the machine go it, it's it's very interesting to read his world war ii letters especially as the war drags on and he gets more and more cynical <laughs> about it hmm but I, he, just, but I, he I got that book for Christmas, so I haven't delved too far into it, but I'm now I'm really <laughs> I'm itching <laughs> to get into it now. Oh, yeah, yeah. The yeah, especially the yeah, the letters in the 40s are fascinating, you know, like but but yeah, he but he, he never lost that sense of like the soil of England is what he believed in as like a, a righteous cause, you know, like this is our home. You know, he didn't believe in the politics of it. He believed in you know, defending his homeland. Like he, he in the politics of it, because like he 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 complains rightly. He's like, we're fighting Hitler, yet our quote unquote friend is a guy just as bad as him. <laughs> Joseph Stalin. Yeah. All right. Well, Pat, you want to go for your third one? All right. So the third one short, unlike my other two. <laughs> This is from the Children of Huron. But through Morgoth, oh, sorry, but though Morgoth had taken all things from him, he could not take from him the need to fight. And that was mm. Tur, or uh, not Tur, sorry, Turin, Turin Turinbar, right? Who, through the curse laid on Huron, has slowly over the course of his life lost everything. <laughs> But multiple times, multiple times, <laughs> yeah. he, he still constantly proves to be, if not a thorn, then a dagger in Morgoth's side. Like no matter what, he is going to get Morgoth back. Um, you know, and I, I, I can't remember that quote is right before. He, I think it's right before he kills the dragon. <laughs> and, Spoiler alert. <laughs> so he kills a knight kills a dragon? Yeah. Preposterous. I know, right? <laughs> so it's it's and at that point it's pretty much, you know, and, and Glarong's going to destroy the last of what he's got, which is this, you know, small group in the woods that includes his sister, although he doesn't know it's his sister. Um, and <laughs> oh. we'll get to that part. <laughs> um, and he's like, yeah, me and three other guys, we're going to go kill this dragon. And this is like, this is a proto dragon. So it doesn't even have wings. It's so huge that it just lays waste to the ground as it, as it slithers over it. Um, and he does it because he's too, he's turn turn bar. <laughs> 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 in middle earth it's like you know it it's like he he would be the character who has that like because i'm batman meme because i'm turin yeah that's <laughs> yes <laughs> huh there's a lot i'm gonna, I'm gonna write a an article about how bat how similar batman and <laughs> turin are <laughs> it's kind of semi Go for it. and then really orphaned and then <laughs> uh, I don't think Batman's as, as supremely unlucky as that's Turin true is. that's true he's unlucky but he's not that unlucky. yeah yeah he's like it's like the job of of the Silmarillion like just everything keeps getting taken away from you from him multiple times <laughs> right it's like you throw together Job Oedipus um I know he's supposed to be based on a character from the 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 Kalevala, the the Finnish mythic cycle. Oh, like, yeah, I don't remember. Was it Kalervo or something? I'm I'm probably messing it up, but but yeah, like uh, to, yeah, I I can't wait till we get to him. He's <laughs> gosh, he's such an interesting character, <laughs> and you just oh, you feel so bad for him because those times he almost turns it around, right? Yeah. He has those moments where he's on a knife's edge of, of having happiness. Yep. And he unwittingly throws it away. That's right, yeah. He makes the, <laughs> he makes what may have looked like a good decision from him, but that turns out to be the wrong one. <laughs> oh. But yeah, sacrifice and service, too. Like his, Hurin, 
his dad loses everything and has to sit there on the side of the volcano and have Morgoth come every once in a while and talk smack to him and yeah. <laughs> say like oh. imagine how petty of a god you have to be to use some of your own life force to keep a dude alive so that so that he has to watch your curse play out i mean come on man <laughs> like yeah morgoth would be he'd be on 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 reddit under that subreddit of you know <laughs> of like petty revenge or whatever yes yes the king of petty revenge <laughs> All right. Well, I'll go for my third one here. And so this is also from Return of the King. Um, a little bit later when they're after the Battle of Pelennor Fields and, you know, our guy Theoden, who I talked about, has also has unfortunately passed away. But they're all debating. It's it's the chapter, the last debate. And they're kind of figuring out, OK, we've defeated the the Easterlings and the army, the, you know, the army from Mordor that was at Minas Tirith. But like that's not you know that's just a fraction of the forces in Mordor, and they're still ultimately are there are trying to give Sam and Frodo a chance, and so they're talking about what should they do, and kind of as they're deciding to just ultimately that they're just going to march on the Black Gate to try to draw Sauron's eye. Uh, this is what Gandalf says because they're saying like, well, what if we destroy Ga- Sauron? Um, you know what? There's going to be some evil next, uh, but Gandalf says. Other evils there are that may come, for Sauron is himself but a servant or emissary. Yet it is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to do what is in us for the succor of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know, so that those who live after may have clean earth to till. But whether they shall have is not ours to rule. And so that's kind of similar to my first one where I was talking, where I had the, you know, Frodo was talking to Sam, or I'm sorry, Frodo was talking to Gandalf about it. But again, it's, I mean, it's, it's a kind of a recurring theme here of, of you do what you can. And that's all that, you know, you don't have to try to be, you know, ever, not everybody's an Aragorn who's going to lead, you know, the armies of, of good against evil. And so it just kind of keeps bringing mind like what can you do in your own you know day to day kind of mundane life to prevent you know to to fight against evil to to bring about good um and yeah like the mother teresa bit we talked about was great of um you know help the help the person you can that's in front of you don't worry about the people that are you know i mean you can definitely help other people throughout the world you know through other means but you know, you have people in your own community or even sometimes within your own family who you can help in that way. So um, I just thought that was kind of a great. And then, you know, after this, obviously, they they go and march on the gate to ultimately, you know, potentially pay that ultimate price to give Frodo and Sam that chance. So I just thought Gandalf was because they're like not even they haven't even defeated Sauron or, and they're, they're worried about like, what's the next bad guy? Uh huh. <laughs> Um, and it's it's funny because we were you know going through the Silmarillion here. They said Sauron is himself a servant or emissary because, and as we've talked about in the Silmarillion, he was Morgoth's lieutenant. So, um. imagine reading that you know with when when the Lord <laughs> of the Rings came out and you had no background for like the Silmarillion re- really, and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> There's somebody bigger and worse out there. <laughs> yeah, Sauron's not the big bad. He's just a big bad. Hmm. <laughs> and he's just the servant of somebody much worse. Yeah. Like it's like, wow, okay, you know. <laughs> but yeah, this quote kind of reminded me too of like, you know, you you fight against and you resist injustice and evil, knowing that because of our fallen world, there will be other injustices and other evils later. But you, as Gandalf says, you uproot the evil in the in your fields where you are now. You know, it's like it, and and just because evil sprouts up again later, it does nothing to diminish the heroism of people who fought against injustice in the past. You know, it's like, you know, the World War Two generation, you know, defeats Hitler, you know, but that didn't put an end to evil once and for all. You know, evil continues to sprout up and injustice and wars and tyrants in other ages. And, you know. You just need to 
to resist the evil of your time without, you know, trusting that God will place people in the future who are, you know, good and faithful people who will resist injustice and intolerance and evil. Yeah, I feel like it's very anti-despair. Like you, you can mm. always despair of the fact that evil exists and will continue to uh, sprout up. Like people will make the wrong choice uh, and will will bring evil about. But you, if you go down that road, then it means you're abandoning courage and you're abandoning your own part to play. It's kind of like, you know, you're in the choir and you've decided not to sing. It's like, no, <laughs> it doesn't matter that like, you know, what comes <laughs> after the choir is a rock band and you're not a fan of rock. Doesn't matter. <laughs> like sing your part in the choir and what comes next is, you know, what comes next. Yeah. Very cool. Well, um, I think we have time to go through our honorable mentions, uh, which were kind of our, we, we each picked three that we wanted and then we kind of each also picked an honorable mention. So I guess we'll, since we have a little, we've gotten through our other ones, we'll go ahead and do those. So Thomas, I'll throw it back to you for your last quote for the, for the evening. All right. So I, I believe this one comes from the, the, the two towers and it's um, while the three hunters, Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli are following the trail of the uruk to try and rescue Merry and Pippin. And they're, they're talking too about how, you know, that the fellowship has been broken up and they have to make this choice, you know, do we rescue Merry and Pippin or do we follow Frodo? And, you know, and they're, they're worried about Frodo because obviously, because they're like, he has to, he has the worst part of all the quest. He has to go to Mordor and he's probably going to die in the process. You know, it like they, they can't see how he's ever going to complete the quest. And Aragorn says to Legolas and Gimli, there are some things that it is better to begin to, to, than to refuse, even though the end may be dark. And so I think that, yeah, that, that again, that, that's another great one that just encapsulates in very small package, you know, one of the central themes of the Lord of the Rings, which is that, you know, even if the, the end is dark and ends in seeming failure, you know, it's better to begin to begin the quest than to sit there and do nothing. Yeah. I mean, that goes all the way back to the Hobbit of Bilbo didn't want to leave his house. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to yeah. stay there and, you know, with his own, with his mother's cozies and whatever else and enjoy. And I mean, it sounds like he had a pretty good, pretty good life going too, but it's yeah. like, he, yeah, you just have to start. And once you start, I mean, it's, I feel like that's so true for anything. Like, and you're cleaning your house and you're like, there's so much to clean. Or, you know, you're talking before this about decluttering and like, yep. there's so much stuff to get overwhelmed. It's like, you just have to start. And then that's like half the battle is just starting. So. All right. Pat, if you want to go for your last one. Yeah. I, sorry. I was trying to remember a quote there. It, it reminds me of one of my favorite or my favorite all time Chesterton quote, which is, if a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Oh, that's Chesterton? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that makes it even better. I already liked that quote. Yeah. And now knowing it's from Chesterton makes it even better. Yeah. That's great. Okay. My last one is from The Unfinished Tales. Hear now all peoples who bow not to the shadow in the east. By the gift of the Lord of the Munberg. We will come to dwell in the land that he names Kalinardon. And therefore I vow in my own name and on behalf of the Eothod of the North that between us and the great people of the West there shall be friendship forever. Their enemies shall be our enemies. Their need shall be our need. And whatsoever evil or threat or assault may come upon them, we will aid them to the utmost end of our strength. This vow shall descend to my heirs, all such as may come after me in our new land, and let them keep it in faith unbroken, lest the shadow fall upon them and they become accursed. And that is the Oath of Errol, sometimes referred to as the Oath of Kyrian, and that is oath sworn by the then King of Gondor, and the 
effectively king of what who the people who become the Rohirrim. Mm -hmm. And this is in the, you know, the days of Gondor, when the king is realizing his strength is not not enough to keep the northern marches anymore. Um, but he needs to still keep them. And he knows of this people that he has a friendship with. And he he brings them up to I'm trying to remember whose tomb it is. Elendil's. Elendil's tomb. Yeah. To forge the alliance and offers them basically what is Rohan, but effectively what was like half of Gondor <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and forges that oath and basically we see the the kind of the fruits of that play out in the in the lord of the rings in the the return of the king in theoden deciding yep we're gonna honor it <laughs> like it's yeah. been a long time since we swore that oath but i'm gonna honor that oath <laughs> uh again i just love the alliance of the of the gondorians and the rohirrim that's so great and then when 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 Kyrion also swears an oath there he he invokes Eru Iluvatar mm -hmm. in his oath, which is so cool. He he invokes those who sit upon the thrones of the West and the one who is above all thrones forever. And I, I got chills when I read that for the first time. I'm like, oh, oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> yeah, there's there's so many good tales in Unfinished Tales, um, but that's probably my favorite. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I've I've not really read any of those. And then, yeah, that's something I definitely want to do down the road in um, maybe future podcast material for us. But yeah, very cool. It's always so, something after the Silmarillion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and then maybe and maybe they'll find a, a trove of of unpublished Tolkien <laughs> in the next couple of years. But all right, so my last one. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to cheat a little bit because there's a quote from the Hobbit film, which I know we joke about the Hobbit film all the time on this podcast. I mean, we're but contractually obligated to, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> got to yeah, mention I, it at least once. <laughs> so I, but I do have a quote from the Hobbit, the book, but I, I the, it ties into a quote in the film. So I wanted to, you know, I, I think the, the film quote is, is pretty cool. So um, but I'll give the I'll give the book Hobbit or the, the Hobbit book quote first. So. It's it's when Thorne's dying at the very end, um, and kind of Bilbo's last words to uh, Thorne were, "This is a bitter adventure if it must end so, and not a mountain of gold can amend it. Yet I'm glad that I have shared in your perils. That has been more than any Baggins deserves." And so that it just initially that just kind of encapsulates Bilbo's experience of you know he was afraid to leave his house and he's now gone on this huge adventure um you know i'm going on an adventure and has come you know he's fought he's riddled with Gollum. he's you know talked to a dragon like all these things and he was just became a friend to the dwarves even if thorin kind of was going crazy toward the end there he still you know always wanted to to serve him in that friendship um <clears throat> in the other dwarves but that brings me to the quote from the film and this is this is in the um in the first one, it's when they, it's just after Frodo, I mean, sorry, for Bilbo had been separated from the dwarves when they were going through the goblin, um, the goblin town. And he had gone, you know, and riddled with Gollum and they think he's, they think he died and they're like, or that he ran away and they're kind of insulting him and being like, yeah, you know, he's good riddance. We don't need him anymore. And then he, you know, takes off the ring and pops up and He's and then Thorin says, or in they're they're saying Bilbo basically says, Why does it matter? And Bil Thorin says, It matters. I want to know why did you come back? And this is the quote I wanted to say. Look, I know you doubt me. I know you always have. And you're right. I often think of Bag End. I miss my books, in my armchair, in my garden. See, that's where I belong. That's home. That's why and that's why I came back. Because you don't have one, a home. It was taken from you but I will help you take it back if I can. Um, so, you know, to give, to give some, some credit to the Hobbit movie, uh, I do like that scene in there where he's, yeah, kind of saying you lost everything, but I have, uh, you know, I could have, I, I have my nice home, but you don't have one and kind of, you know, recognizing for, for one of the first times that he's, you know, uh, there's other people out there who don't have it, you know, as quite as cozy as he does. Um, 
But, he stops so, thinking about himself. You know, yeah. he takes it off his his own troubles about how like, oh, I don't have bag end anymore. I don't have my my seed cakes and my, you know, all that other stuff. And, you know, he starts thinking about other people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, the, the first the first Hobbit movie actually has some some a lot of good material in it. Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and I mean, I think that's I one think of them. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've said the first one is, is definitely the best of them. Um, but that's another, you know, down the road, we'll, we'll have to discuss those, but, um, well, those are, I think we've gotten through all our quotes. So we do have a little bit of feedback to go that we wanted to touch on here. Um, unless anybody else has anything to say on any of these quotes or on this topic of sacrifice and service, or if we've, I mean, you, you, the whole, the whole legendarium is a quote of sacrifice and service. Yeah. Like, yeah. So it's Pretty like, much. Yeah. Read the legendarium. If you want. <laughs> you know, quotes. Just read, just read it all. It's all of it. <laughs> all right. But our feedback, first feedback, and this, this was on our uh, Two Towers episode. Martin Reynolds on YouTube said, Great show. I never can get enough of J.R.R. Tolkien and this beautiful and well-told story. Tolkien and his books are timeless. They are important for all generations now and the generations to come. The books give us courage to stand against the evils of the world. And this is where he asks a question. I'm not sure if I will receive an answer, but I have a question. Are Tolkien's books banned anywhere in the world? I would just wonder if these books that provide hope are allowed to be read anywhere, or I guess I think you meant to say are not allowed to be read anywhere. Have they been banned or are Tolkien's books allowed to be every, read everywhere in the world? Just curious. And again, great show. Thank you and bless you all. And uh, so thanks, Martin. And I did try to look this up. And from what I could tell, I really couldn't find anything mm. where they were banned. And funnily enough, as I was looking up, I saw how it was banned in the United States in the when it first came out for being like satanic related. Oh. <laughs> so um uh. but I, I mean as far as I could tell I I didn't really see any particular places it was banned. I would imagine like I think you know I looked up some of the countries you'd think of, but I mean I th I think for the most part it's not, you know, if they have access to, you know, most literature, they have access to this. But um I don't know if any of y'all knew anything or heard anything different there. And not so much in terms of it being banned, but like, no, it's, I pretty much saw the same thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did hear something though, that, um, not that the high about the Hobbit specifically where, um, when there was going to be a, a German translation in the 1930s, there was a bit of an issue because, Adolf Hitler was in power at this time mm. and they had requirements in Germany where books could not be published if the author was not an Aryan An Aryan being, of course, this mumbo jumbo made up race <laughs> that Adolf Hitler liked to promote. Yeah. But <laughs> in any case, like it, Tolkien's publisher forwarded him the German publisher's request for confirmation that Tolkien was an Aryan, which the German publisher thought he was because Tolkien is actually a Germanic last name. And Tolkien became very angry. He's like he, he wrote this letter back, which basically said, look, I, I think your racial laws are really stupid. And if by me being an Aryan, what you really want to know is if I have any Jewish background. And he says, like, all that I can say is that I'm ashamed not to have any Jewish background. And if I did any and if I did, it would actually make me very proud. And then he tells his publisher, look, if they're going to make an issue of this, a German translation can go hang, he says. So and I, I'm not sure if that eventually got worked out, but at least during, you know, the Nazi period, I don't think The Hobbit was published in Nazi Germany Ugh. because he wouldn't provide his Aryan credentials. <laughs> How would you even yeah. prove that? Like I, <laughs> like, like I get like now if, if it was like a real thing, then you could like, you know, 22 and me or whatever. You're like, oh, yeah, I've got it, you know, but like, how would you have done that in the 1930s? I've got a letter from my grandma. Oh. <laughs> like, when, when... <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, the, I remember reading about this. These ridiculous laws where, like, you had to, you know, it, before in Nazi Germany, before you married anyone, you both 
both partners had to bring in like these family records going back like six or eight generations or some other like baloney hmm. to be like, oh, yeah, we're we're pure blood Aryans. It's just ugh, nonsense. Like there's so much mumbo jumbo like bunk science in. I, I read a whole book about like bunk science in Nazi Germany. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't believe it. But in any case, yeah. Uh, the, the Hobbit may have been banned in Nazi Germany. So there's that. <laughs> yeah. And probably, you know, probably was in, in Soviet Russia, I would imagine. Um, or, you know, at least was restricted to some extent. But, um, yeah, and in the U.S., like I said. <laughs> um, let me see what I found there. Yeah, it looks like it was originally banned in, in or it, it wasn't, it was banned in various states beca um, mm. because it was considered satanic at the time. So, um, I guess because magic, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the same reason everybody got up in arms about the Harry Potter books, I think. So, yeah. But I'm, you know, hopefully that was a pretty, I think, you know, if people had even thought about it at all, it'd be like, okay, this is not, <laughs> you know, in, in any way. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, thank you, Martin, for that feedback. And, um, yeah, if any of our listeners know of any, anything regarding it's being banned, let us know. But from what I could tell, at least currently it's not banned anywhere, but, um, and then our other piece of feedback was from Johnny Osprey on two towers, just said great episode. So thanks, Johnny. Um, so, well, I think that will do it for this episode of the secrets of middle earth. We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Aga O, Sean M, Sean N, David B, and Jordana A. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give help us to continue to create the secrets of Middle Earth and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them at sqpn.com slash give. Now we'd love to hear from you. What did you think of our discussion of sacrifice and service? Do you have any favorite Tolkien quotes on this or other topics? And how are you celebrating Tolkien Reading Day? You can let us know at sqpn.com slash Middle Earth, on our Facebook page or on Twitter, send an email to Middle Earth at sqpn.com, or visit our channel on the StarQuest Discord server at sqpn.com slash Discord. So join us next time as we continue our discussion of the Silmarillion. But until then, Patrick Mason, thank you for joining and sharing the secrets of Middle Earth. Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me on. And Thomas Lerner, thank you as well. Thanks so much, Jeff. This was great. And once again, I'm Jeff Hecker. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Middle Earth on StarQuest. Here's another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Find the show wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash mysterious.